You uh, you bust out your inner super tramp on uh, barely breathing with a clarinet solo. Oh, that wasn't me. <laughs> Where did that come from? Uh, well, there's a kind of a similar pace song on the second record that I wanted to try to sneak a clarinet solo into, but it didn't happen there, so I thought this was a good opportunity to do that. We had our friend Peter Hess. Yeah. That's who did it, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Peter played it. Peter, we just said, seems like a clarinet solo would work there, <laughs> and he came in. Does Super Trap use a lot of clarinets? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I was aware know, Bloody Well Right and Take the Long Way Home. And yeah, oh, yeah, Bloody Well Right, that's right. Take the yeah, Long Way yeah, Home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, now I hear it, yeah. Um, it's more of a Dixieland thing than Super Tramp. Did they have a dedicated clarinet player? Yes, they did. His name was John Halliwell. Wow. Wow, how do you do that on stage and still look cool? A rock don't. concert. Uh, listen, you don't. it was the 70s. <laughs> there were a lot of things you could do in the 70s. And they were underwritten by that Dutch millionaire that uh, let them do anything that they wanted. Oh, okay. I didn't know about that. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, that's the only reason Supertramp managed to get through their first two albums is because they had this Dutch stoner millionaire that gave them all this money to, to, to finance their career. And it wasn't until Crime of the Century came along that the band actually started selling some, some nice. records. God, a Dutch millionaire. There's probably a lot of Dutch millionaires <laughs> behind a lot of those 70s bands. <laughs> <laughs> Whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. You're uh, speaking of overseas. You're getting some interesting appreciation out of the UK. Yeah, we've been, we've been we didn't go over there until the third record, Boys and Girls in America. But once we did, it kind of caught right up to the states. And now we've done a lot of lot of work there. But it's been it's been great. I mean, our last show in London was really big, and uh, we did Glastonbury this year, and it's exciting. I mean, I think it, it, in some ways it's surprising to me. But then when you talk to their music fans, they're so encyclopedic over there that. You know, they talk about records well, that I don't know about. Just go into to any record store and all the magazines that they manage yeah, to. Exactly. I mean, Q and Mojo and Uncut and Record Collector. And there's and so much of it. I, I mean, it comes out all the time. So they have to kind of get excited about something or else they wouldn't be able to fill up their magazines. Well, and there's also, I think, you know, we th on this side of the Atlantic, we think to th seem to think of Britain as, as something completely different than they view themselves. I mean, we think of it as the, the birthplace of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and, you know, a million other bands. But they, you know, this cold, damp rock in the North Atlantic, have this fascination with America. Yeah, they do. They and the American do. story and the, and, the, and the American narrative. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, people like Bruce Springsteen or whatever have gone over there and, and they're just maybe even bigger there than they are in the States or, you know, I mean, or just as big, and you know, and that's, that is a real fascination with something American. Yeah, Killers, Pixies. Sure, sure. Uh, Nirvana and the whole grunge thing before yeah. it actually hit here in North absolutely. America. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, are you with? Are you playing a double neck guitar now? Uh, I've had it for five years. Yeah, yeah. You don't see a lot of people playing double necks. Anyway. They're heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's tw you know, twice the size. Because we were uh, we were at Rush the other night, mm -hmm. and you know I half expected Alex to Alex Lifeson to break out one, but um, he's just got this huge rack of effects that I guess all he needs is to trigger a couple of things, and he's he's good. He could turn on the second neck. Yeah, possibly. I think Geddy Lee has some kind of uh, Rickenbacker that might be have two necks on it as a bass. Well, he played. Did he play a two neck? No, he had a Fender Jazz the entire night. Last night, but we were actually we were. I was thinking, you know, the last time I the first time I saw Rush was in 1977, and oh. they were surrounded by banks and banks of, of, of keyboards and you know Moog foot uh, Moog foot pedals and and everything else, and they were pretty much rooted to their places on the stage. And when we saw them on on Tuesday, they were running around all over the place because everything's triggered with you know a sequencer yeah. and everything's MIDI together, and and it, it was just completely different. Yeah, I guess that's progress, but at the same time, you know. Well, I missed it. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying, because uh, you always want to see people playing with things, you know. Yeah, he had an old uh, oh, mini Moog or micro Moog that he was still playing the lead lines from Tom Sawyer and everything on, which yeah. is kind of cool. Cool, cool. So I guess you guys are going to be touring for, for quite some time. We're, yeah, well, we have two more on this one, but yeah, but in the big picture, we keep, we keep going uh, until the end of the year, pretty much. I have uh, one more question. This came also through, uh, through email. Uh, it's from Ben in Edmonton. He wanted to know why you write mostly, in his opinion, about smaller towns as opposed to the bright lights, big city kinds of places. I think it's just, I mean, from a, the lyric standpoint, I just, I'm from a smaller town, so I feel more comfortable and more knowledgeable about it. Um, yeah, Minneapolis is a big, small town. Well, that's 
the small town that I write mainly about. So I, I, I guess if he's thinking it's a small town, that's, I mean, it is a pretty small town compared to somewhere like New York. But it's something I feel like I just have a better understanding of. And I, I think I know the people in a, in a town like that, but at least the types of people better than I do in a, in a more cosmopolitan place. See, I'm, I'm from Winnipeg originally. We used to go to Minneapolis because that was the big city. Yeah, well, it's all relative, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Because, um, you know, Mexico City is even bigger. Yeah, but they don't have the twins or the Vikings. No, they don't. Or the, go <laughs> or the Gophers. They might soon have the Vikings. 